Mm. I, I think one of the other philosophical factors is, is the fear of dualism um, in, uh, in yes. science. Uh, that, that, that Sir John Eccles uh, put forward a dualistic understanding of mind-brain interaction, but he's a heretic, or what knows, he's, he's regarded as a heretic. And so there are huge efforts going on to try and maintain the position of consciousness within the brain. And if one goes to your work, Peter, um, and, and which not only in near-death experiences, but, but also if you push it one stage further to survival of consciousness, or indeed the work of Ian Stevenson on mm. <laughs> memories of uh, previous lives, uh, then, then um, you cannot maintain the position anymore. Um, that consciousness cannot exist independently of brain processes. It becomes very yeah. difficult to do that because the, the evidence for post-death communications is very strong and very good. And um, it, I, th I think what we need is much more science on it now because uh, you can't get funding for these things. Mm. Uh, we put a, this is to deal with near-death experiences and political perception, we put a grant into a very famous medical charity in this country and they said the science is great. Well done. Yeah, you can go into the casualty department and in people with cardiac arrests, you can um, uh, find out what they experience, that's fine. But you're not allowed to put your boards up in case they leave their bodies and see the boards, which is what we want you to do. And they said, no, you may not do that part of the experiment. Why? Because they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified that they will have uh, um, broken one of these rigid taboos of mind and brain being very closely linked and in fact, as you said, uh, mind created by brain. They wouldn't do it. But can, can you actually see that situation changing? Because supposing we had a rerun of the, the British Association meeting in, in 2008, uh, I, I would anticipate a similar reaction. Uh, or or do, you, do you think there's a way of, of getting beyond that? Well, I do. I'm the, the thing is, you'd get the similar reaction because the same science journalists yes. all the times and yes. so on. Um, and you've got the, the same people around who put forward these reactionary quotes. And Professor Peter Atkins said, telepathy is nothing but a charlatan's fantasy. When I discussed it with him on BBC Radio 5, um, he said he hadn't... I asked him if he'd looked at the evidence. He said, of course not, but I'd be very suspicious of it. And you yeah. know, he doesn't need to look at the evidence. He knows the truth. And... Richard Dawkins is very similar. There are plenty of people who, they're not going to change. But uh, my own view is that the, what's happening is that there are these very dogmatic people who are called upon by the press because they can be guaranteed to make clear statements that are easy to quote, sound bites. Yes. Uh, they reinforce the prejudices of some science journalists. But the fact is most people within the scientific world, in my opinion and experience, are not as dogmatic. What we have is in place a kind of social constraint. Most scientists don't mm. speak out yeah. for fear of being thought peculiar, weird or something, but actually the number who really believe this dogmatic materialism is a minority. I think it's a bit the like... The very vociferous one. Yes, a vociferous mm. one. Mm. I think it's a bit like the, the state of materialism in Russia in the time of Brezhnev. You know, in the Soviet <laughs> Union there was an official belief in materialism, yes. uh, you know, Marxism. Yes. Um, if you didn't pay lip service to it in public, it seriously damaged your career. But how many people really believed it? When the Soviet Union collapsed, I mean, how many totally committed communists are there in Russia today? I mean, not that many, there are some. But I think science is like that, and I think that within scientific institutions there's a large minority, and in many institutions a majority, who don't really buy into this materialist dogma. They pretend to during working hours, but if you talk to people in, in the evening over a glass of wine, you find much broader and more interesting views. I think what will bring about the mm. change is something more analogous to the gay liberation movement. You know, uh, uh, science is full of closet holists. Yes. My, yes. my uh, idea is that if people come out of the closet, they'll find that in almost every scientific department there are people interested in these questions. They'd then be able to discuss them in the tea room and uh, instead of keeping quiet and only talking in the evenings to their friends or family about them. Of course, this was actually one of the rationales of originating the scientific and medical network, so that people could come out of the closet and, and, and talk, talk among rational people themselves about these topics which you've been describing as taboo. 
Yes. So mm. it was a safe mm. house, really. Yes. Yes. Where yes. people could do that. But you see, that's the first stage: is for people to cease feeling they're isolated and there's no one else you yes. can talk to. Yes. But now, what happens is that instead of the scientific and medical network just being a group of people voluntarily join and meet other like-minded people, we need this in every science department, as it were, that 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 people would feel so this is modelled what can be done when scientists yes. really talk to each other without yes. fear and can explore questions that really interest them. But we need to take this model out. It needs to be something that can actually be done in, in normal science departments. Now I think that's a very good point.